we inherently have this innate fear of change because it requires us to expend energy trying to adapt to that, which goes back to biological evolution. Um, and so having the right people on the bus is key in many ways. But if you go through a big change process and certain people don't want to come along for the ride, uh, I think making it easier for those people to leave the organization than stay and sabotage what you're trying to do is something that, that organizations might want to consider because you can have all the best systems and capabilities and whatnot. You can invest in training and all this sort of stuff, but unless people really want it, I mean, if people are more concerned looking at their watch and seeing how, long, how much longer they have to stay in the office for before they clock off for the day, uh, then it's going to be a very, very difficult uphill slog. So you're a smart business committed to innovation, to service and to modern marketing. And you're asking, what's next? Wondering how you can become even more innovative. My name is Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and this is the InnovaBuzz podcast where we share all kinds of tips, advice and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Hi innovators, it's really great to be back with another episode. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. I trust you enjoyed our most recent interviews with Jeff Hoffman, co-founder of Priceline.com and Julia Streets of Streets Consulting. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Steve Glaveski. Steve is founder and CEO of Collective Campus, a corporate innovation and startup accelerator based in Melbourne with clients across the world. He is the author of the book Employee to Entrepreneur and previously self-published two books, including an Amazon bestseller. Steve also co-founded Lemonade Stand, a children's entrepreneurship program he also hosts the Apple podcast charting Future Squared, is a founding investor in Concrete, a blockchain-enabled share registry, and is a contributor to the Harvard Business Review. So look out for a fantastic interview today. Today's episode is brought to you by the Transformational Marketing Hub, where you'll find a host of free and exceptionally useful information to help you transform your marketing. You can access the Transformational Marketing Hub by visiting innovabiz.co forward slash VIP. If you don't yet have an account, don't worry. Click the blue take a peek inside button and check it out. As I said, it's free and exceptionally useful. In our discussion today, Steve talked to me about the entrepreneurial mindset and loosely held opinions and continuous learning. We also talked about how to take strategy and cultural aspects from successful products or people and apply them in another context. And we talked about growing your business by prioritizing, outsourcing and automating. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Steve Glaveski. Hi, I'm your host Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from right near my neck of the woods, Melbourne in Australia, Steve Glaveski, who is the CEO and co-founder of Collective Campus a corporate innovation and startup accelerator. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. It's a great privilege to have you as a guest. No, thank you so much for having me on the show, Jürgen. Liz Wiseman, who was our guest on episode 153 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we interview Steve and introduced us. So a big hello to Liz. Now, Steve, you also host the Future Squared podcast and you're the author of a new book that came out late last year, Employee to Entrepreneur, How to Earn Your Freedom and Do Work That Matters, which explores entrepreneurship from the lenses of technology, psychology, 
philosophy, economics, mindset, mindfulness, productivity, and fitness, and a lot more. So I'm really looking forward to digging into that a little more today. But before we start talking about all things innovation, entrepreneurship, and business, Give us a bit of a high-level snapshot of your background. How did you get to where you are today and what were some of the pivotal moments in that journey? Sure. So the pivotal moments essentially, well, before I get to the pivotal moments, I mean, I spent about 10 years in the corporate world, uh, essentially seeking to conform to society's expectations of what success looked like, you know, um, go to university, get the degree, get the gig in the corporate world, start climbing the ladder, all that good stuff. So I spent some time with uh, brands like EY, KPMG, Macquarie Bank. So some big, reputable global uh, brands, if you will. Um, but what I found was even though I had the quote-unquote trappings of success, the six-figure salary, uh, all of that good stuff, um, deep down, I didn't really feel that the work I was doing uh, was aligned with my natural strengths and inclinations. Um, and I, I basically say I was miserably comfortable. So I was comfortable, <laughs> but miserable at the yeah. same time. And uh Essentially, what happened was I started looking for alternatives and, and uh, I observed that there was a lot of vacant office space in the corporate world and you know, my first foray into entrepreneurship was essentially a platform called Hotdesk, which uh, based upon the fundamentals of Airbnb, essentially an Airbnb for office space and meeting room bookings and things like that, which I envisaged would help to plug some of that gap that I saw in the office space market. Um, and that was essentially how I started to make my way in the entrepreneurial domain. But since then, it's been a lot of hops, skips, and jumps. And now I'm doing something completely different. But that's usually the way that entrepreneurship and innovation goes. You start off with you know, your grand plans and what you think is an awesome idea. And you take that first step, you take that second step, and you quickly realize that that awesome idea isn't so awesome. But on that journey, you learn a lot of lessons um, that put you on a much better path. Yeah. So what, what are some of the big lessons you've learned that kind of contributed to the pivots that you've had? Yeah, sure. I mean, ultimately, anybody who's getting into entrepreneurship today, so at Collective Campus, you know, we've worked with close to 100 on, uh, startups. Uh, we've helped them raise about $25 million. And so many early stage entrepreneurs will basically ask me, you know, what's the number one thing I can do to, to grow my business? And realistically, I mean, it, it is just being really really honest about the assumptions that your business idea is based on and getting out there and testing those assumptions as quickly as you possibly can. And that could be across uh, your product, your value proposition, your customer segment, uh, your distribution channels, your price point, your revenue model, like so many different things. And those things are always changing in the dynamic. I mean, you might have a marketing channel that works for you this month, but then you've exhausted it. And so next month, you need to keep testing and figuring out how do you keep bringing in customers at a, say, cost per acquisition that's less than the lifetime value of that customer? And, um, you know, reflecting on my own journey with Hotdesk, I think I just spent too much time doing the same thing every day and expecting a different result. And you do that long enough and you quickly run out of money and enthusiasm and energy for what you're doing. So that's, that's one of the big, big lessons that I took out of that process. Um, and, and, Tying in with that is this whole notion of strong opinions loosely held. Um, <laughs> I think for for a long time, I th and, and that's something that I suppose we're you know going back to uh, say childhood education and tertiary education in the corporate world. You know, we're expected to put forward this uh, image that we know everything and that we shouldn't say uh, mm -hmm. that we don't know what the answer is and and, and whatnot and. For so long, I guess I echoed that sort of philosophy in my behavior. Um, but then I quickly realized, well, not quickly, I guess I slowly, painstakingly slowly realized that actually just because somebody attacks my uh, opinion or view or, or whatever it is, that's not an attack on me. So I guess there was a tendency to take that defensively and, and whatnot. Um, just see that as an attack on the position and that the more open you are to having your assumptions challenged about your business or whatever it is, the more likely you are to get to what's right. Uh, and so the moment you think you have all the answers, that's when you stop learning. So I think testing and just holding that strong opinions, loosely held philosophy, I think for me has just cut ego out of the equation. And by doing that, um, I've been blessed enough to, to, to learn the things I need to learn on that journey. And there's a hell of a lot of them. It's not just like there's one or two things. I mean, there's 
if, it depends on how deep you go, how granular you want to go. There's hundreds of things that I've learned on that journey, right? So, uh, yeah. but it, it, I'd say that they're, they're some of the key things there. Yeah, well, uh, one of the things that occurred to me as you were telling us that is is there's a whole different mindset, isn't there? If you come out of the corporate world, if you present a half-baked idea to the next level of management, you're often sent away and go and do some more work on that. It mm-hmm. needs more homework, more preparation. So there's a kind of a mindset in the corporate world of it has to be perfect before it's kind of given more exposure as in going to the marketplace or so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's something I talk about in the book. Uh, mm. I talk about all these so-called um, strengths that you pick up or, or behavioral attributes that you pick up in the corporate world around research, analysis, planning, um, and basically a lot of um, – political aligning, if you will, um, yeah. getting all the right heads on the bus, having lots of steering committee meetings and things of that persuasion. And it is it is in very many ways about getting it perfect before you leave the building. But ironically, it's almost impossible to do that because you've got to get out of the building, especially if you're um, uh, exposed exploring, say, emerging technologies or emerging innovations, whether they're tech or business models, you need to get out of the building to learn from, from your customers. And so if That's you're right. trying to get it perfect before you leave the building, it doesn't work. So hmm. when you are yes. an entrepreneur, sorry, go for it, Jürgen. Yeah, I was just going to say, I was having a conversation with someone this morning around um, how do you bring more personalized marketing into, you know, human marketing into a corporate environment. And I talked about that very thing about getting out with you and working with your customer very early on with ideas so that they help develop and shape the ideas. And of course, then it comes back to what you said earlier about testing assumptions as quickly as you can, because then, you know, if, if you're off base in terms of meeting the customer needs, they'll tell you early on. And so then you can refocus your work and energy on the things that will contribute to having a successful outcome. Exactly. And that's something uh, Beth Comstock, who was heading up GE, uh, heading up GE's innovation program for many years, said on my podcast a couple of weeks ago was that, you know, marketing for so long has been something that large organizations have thought of. It's been an afterthought. Once you've got the product, then we market it. But she said, right. you know, marketing is something you do at the start, not at the end. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. All right. And, and I like what you said about the moment you think you have all the answers, you stop learning because, again, coming out of the corporate world, there is that um, almost trained behavior, isn't there, that, that you have to have all the answers. And it, it, I know when I first went into my business, I thought, well, I need to be the expert on the particular area that I'm wanting to help people with. So I need to have all the answers. But at the same time, um, I'm a lifelong learner. I love learning new things. I love trying out new things. I love doing experiments. So I was always learning new things and I, I could never figure out why there was some sort of disconnect there. You know, so it's still a level of unhappiness that mm. you were describing before about in the corporate world. And then at some point I realized that, you know, I don't have to know everything. I can go out to the customer and say, well, I don't know the answer to that, but let's see if we can work it out. Or let's see if I can find somebody who's an expert in that particular area. Because at the end of the day, it's about serving the customer. Definitely. And um, paradoxically, though, I, I think what you find there is if you go into a conversation with a, a, a customer or a prospect and you tell them that, look, I'm about 70% sure that this is going to work based on X, Y, Z variable, but there's these other things that we're not quite sure about um, that we need to figure out. Um, if you go in there with that sort of um, approach versus oh, this is what we're going to do. It's going to work. It's worked for other companies we, we've worked with in the past. 100% sure, guaranteed. Um, I'm going to trust you more in the former example because mm. you're way more transparent and you're way more believable. And, and I think that whole notion of uh, coming out there with a silver bullet solution for people, you might be able to pull the wool over some uh, people's eyes, but more often than not, if you think it's a silver bullet solution, it's probably not, and they're going to see that very quickly. Um, so yeah, there is a paradox there around coming into a situation with not having all the answers, being transparent about that, but being um, deliberate around what we actually need to figure out in order to increase the likelihood of success. And I think that that way you build trust and that way you involve your customer in that journey. Um, they understand it and they're more likely to work with you on an ongoing basis. And that's a big part of 
branding as well and branding yourself as, as a as a professional rather than someone who's just a snake oil salesman and is going to put everything they put forward as, as a silver bullet, especially in the space of innovation, which is fraught with ambiguity and uncertainty. And there are simply no silver bullets because what works in one context for one organization, uh, for one business unit in, in one country with a certain reg- legislation that it's bound by will not necessarily and most likely not work for another organization with totally different variables. Hmm. Yeah, and that comes back to matching things to the customer's specific needs and then really understanding what they are and understanding Mm. the customer. So you talked about snake oil, and I know you wrote a blog post recently (laughs) about beware of digital agencies doing corporate innovation So and, and compared that to the Australian gold rush of the 1850s. So can you tell us a little bit about that and and the snake oil analogy? Yeah, I mean, it's not just digital agencies. It's basically any, you know, innovation consultant, corporate innovation, quote unquote, expert. Um, the, The analogy basically goes back to the fact that, you know, whenever there is a lucrative economic opportunity that's just emerged, there is a rapid movement of people to the opportunity. And that goes back to, you know, the gold rush in the 1850s, uh, Ballarat, Victoria. But that appears today in, in various ways, whether it's the cryptocurrency hype cycle mm-hmm. from a, about a year ago, it shows up in military defense contracts. Um, you look at digital transformation, companies are tipped to spend about $2 trillion US dollars globally by 2022. So wherever there is, one, an economic opportunity, but two, also a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty, as there was in the case of cryptocurrency, as there was in, in the case of the gold rush, because you're not quite sure exactly where you're going to find that gold. Um, there will be people selling you tools and techniques and, and stuff that they say will definitely help you mine for that gold. And we saw that with crypto, and we're seeing that now with um, uh, corporate innovation. Um, and corporate innovation is attracting a lot of so-called um, experts to to the table. Um, in many cases, they are digital agencies. And if you look at digital agencies who have long served startups, um, recently we saw the high profile um, bankruptcies or, or liquidations rather of the likes of uh, Appstar in, in Australia and Bazinga. Um, and what we found was a lot of mismanagement in those cases. These agencies would just take on a hell of a lot of work um, to meet their targets. They would ship that work offshore. Mm. Uh, it would be done very poorly, uh, but the client will be paying top dollar for that. Ultimately, in some cases, they'd spend between $50,000 and $100,000 on prototypes, which didn't serve to test any assumptions. So, that, so they weren't really prototypes. Um, and this is a, a widespread practice in the digital agency space. And I'm not saying it's every agency. It's definitely not. But what concerns me is at the moment, agencies have seen that, oh, wow, corporates are spending big rather than serve a number of startups, let's get out there and work with the big end of town because they're going to fork out on six-figure deals. And the way they're positioning it is we can help you build your ideas. Um, for $50,000 to $100,000, we'll build your ideas. But the thing is, as we've said, as we've already established in this show, the idea is usually a commodity. Execution of that idea is not. So if you're spending, say, a million dollars on building out 10 to 20 ideas, but you haven't really gone through that process of collaborative refinement with the market to know that those ideas are actually worth building, chances are you're just going to throw a million dollars down the bin. And and the um, worst thing about that is the unintended consequences that come with that, which is you're going to lose senior executive buying. Um, if it's a public failure, then shareholders may start to ask questions, as was the case with GE last year and the um, uh, forced resignation of Jeff Imelt. Um entrepreneurs within the organization will start to get disgruntled because it's like, well, we spent all this money, it went nowhere, um, and they may look to work with a more progressive organization elsewhere. So in terms of the flow-on effects of this, the consequences can be quite disastrous for the organization um, and the unlocking of the people, Mm -hmm. the unlocking of the talent of the people that work there as well. Um, So that's something. Also makes them more risk-averse to try something else in the future, right? It, exactly. It just creates a, a, f- a culture of fear. Um, mm. And that's something that with a lot of the organizations that I'm working with in the corporate innovation space, we see that everywhere. And it's really difficult to try and break down that culture of fear. So it, the last thing we, I want to see organizations doing who may not have that culture of fear yet is going out there, spending big money on these digital agencies who are going to develop their half-baked ideas. Um, and then ultimately, You've got these big losses, senior executives pull the rug from under the innovation program and that culture of fear presents itself and, and, and people are scared to try things again. 
Um, and, and that's definitely not what we want to say. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be just digital agencies. It's anybody who's trying to take advantage of the ambiguity who puts forward a case that they have all the answers when in reality they don't and they're just looking to make a quick buck. Hmm. And it, it reminds me of, I mean, one of the things I talk about quite a lot is making marketing more human again in this digital age, but at the same time, having a really comprehensive system for marketing. So, you know, you talked earlier about marketing doesn't start when the product's developed and you need to go sell it. Marketing starts at the beginning. And I also say that marketing doesn't finish when the client has signed on the dotted line. It, it still is there as part of the business going forward so delivering an exceptional outcome to the customer is part of marketing um and and then following up and making sure that the results you know measuring the results making the adjustments going forward is still part of marketing so it all kind of ties in together with you know and and it reminds me because i think you said culture Mm -hmm. there in that conversation as well so in some ways it comes right back to culture doesn't it so in the book you talk about um validating the idea early and also you know starting with the why simon sinek quote of of the corporation so you know what, what are your thoughts on getting the culture right to begin with hmm yeah so i mean and you're probably familiar with that old adage that culture is strategy uh, for breakfast, but I think strategy can actually inform the culture in many ways because mm. if people's behavior is a byproduct of you know biological dispos- predispositions, so there's not much you can do about that, but behavior can also be influenced by their one's environment. And so if you update policies and processes and whatnot on the back of a new strategy, um, then people's behavior will start to reflect those policies and processes. So one example of that is uh, if you have a existing process whereby if I raise an idea, I need to complete a business case. Um, and that business case is 20 or 30 pages long. It asks me for traditional financial metrics like internal rate of return, net present value, payback period, and, and, and whatnot. And that needs to get signed off by, say, three or four people. And the minimum amount I'm going to get is $50,000. Then that's quite risky. Um, it also requires me to have all the answers up front. So I'm going to do a hell of a lot of research before I actually do anything. And then getting that sign off from a number of different people is just going to slow things down. So it could take several months to just get that signature and, and start to do anything. Now, if you replace that with some sort of a process whereby, okay, I've got an idea and I want just $1,000 to test this idea. Um, and if I can validate the underlying assumptions, then I'll qualify for an extra $5,000. Um, now, if, because it's just $1,000, you might just have one person who needs to approve that. You may just have to complete a one or two page uh, sort of plan or overview as to what you're seeking the money for. And in more cases than not, you'll get that approval quite quickly and you'll be able to test your idea. And by doing that, the organization Um, is creating behaviors where people test ideas quickly. They get out of the building quickly. um, And that starts to shift the culture. Um, Similarly, with things like performance reviews. I mean, if your organization has annual performance reviews where it's more or less seen as a tick and flick exercise, then the whole notion of personal development kind of suffers. But if you've got uh, an organization where you have frequent, say, uh, informal check-ins on, say, a fortnightly basis, or you just or you start to develop this culture of radical transparency where you do away with performance reviews altogether and you just make it okay to uh, provide that constructive feedback on an ongoing basis, people start to um, warm to that. And that becomes the the thing. And because you're constantly getting feedback around how you could be better, uh, the culture starts to be one of continuous improvement at a personal level as well. Um, So if you change the policies and the processes, people's behavior falls in line, I find. Um, Now, there will be pushback in some elements of an organization because we inherently have this innate fear of change because it requires us to expend energy trying to adapt to that, which goes back to biological evolution. Um, And so having the right people on the bus is key in many ways. But if you go through a big change process and certain people don't want to come along for the ride, uh, I think making it easier for those people to leave the organization than stay and sabotage what you're trying to do is something that, that organizations might want to consider because you can have 
all the best systems and capabilities and whatnot. You can invest in training and all this sort of stuff, but unless people really want it, I mean, if people are more concerned looking at their watch and seeing how long, how much longer they have to stay in the office for before they clock off for the day, uh, then it's going to be a very, very difficult uphill slog. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's an interesting analogy, the, the performance appraisal with the you know, early testing of prototypes. I hadn't actually thought of it in that context before, but it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It's a, From mm. a strategy point of view, it's the same thing. If you're giving constant ongoing feedback that you have the ability to influence behavior much more, much earlier, and as you say, um, you know, have the right people there in the right jobs and motivated. So, oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, short feedback loops are absolutely everything. And I say they show up in so many different domains. I mean, last year I, I tried my hand at stand-up comedy and I realized, <laughs> how, you know, it's, it's, um, it's one of those demands. It's not like where I'm running ads, say, on Facebook to test um, appetite for a different product. I can run a lot of ads in one day and get in front of hundreds of thousands of people. But something like stand-up, you basically go out to an open mic night, you may be waiting for one hour or two hours. And then if you're lucky, you get like a five minute set and you test your, your material. It might work uh, more likely than not. In my case, it, it, it won't work. <laughs> and, but then you can go back and update your material, but you've got to go back maybe the next night or the next week for another uh, open mic night. And so the learning curve, that feedback loop is really, really slow and quite painful. Um, but in many cases, it doesn't need to be. So when you're talking about uh, you know, performance appraisals, if you have that culture of transparency, you're getting that feedback on, on an ongoing basis. Um, it's like they say, if you get 1% better each day over the course of a year, you end up 37 times better by the end of the year. Um, and so that rapid feedback loop, whether it's in product development, whether it's in military strategy, whether it's in stand-up comedy, you know, test mm -hmm. your jokes with as many people as possible and as frequent as possible basis so you can get them to a point where they're good enough. That oftentimes is a difference between success um, and failure. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it shows up in so many demands. You know, I'm trying to surf at the moment as well or trying to learn how to surf. And, uh, you know, th there's so many things that are contingent on being able to learn, like the weather being good, the surf being good, um, all these things. So whatever you can do to speed up the rate at which you learn um, is key. So in, in, in the case of surfing, it's a matter of checking the, the surf report and going out to the beach that's got the best waves on that day. So you give yourself the best chance of catching as many of them as possible. Um, so you can get better at surfing rather than just winging it and turning up to some beach where it's just completely flat. And then you've just wasted a day of learning. Hmm. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things that came up for me there. The first thing is I, I seem to attract a lot of people doing stand up comedy at the moment for the <laughs> podcast, which is quite interesting. But of course, as you said, the I mean, to me, it's um, the whole business around five success principles and, and one of the ones there is being aware of what's happening, being aware of the impact you're having on other people, being aware of you know, what impact your prototype is having on clients um, who are testing it, being aware of what, you know, whether your jokes are um, receiving mm -hmm. laughs or not and so on. So that's the first thing. Yeah, I mean, there's that. And I mean, just to double down on the environment piece in terms of culture, I mean, if you look at it from the, from the perspective of, say, willpower, I mean, human beings only have so much willpower. Every decision we make over the course of the day depletes that. So, but the best way to circumvent our depleting willpower or our very limited reserves is to create an environment where it's it becomes a default option. So whenever something is a default option, we're more likely to take that option. And that, again, goes back to evolutionary um, biology. But one example of that is if I don't want to eat, um, say, a bag of potato chips um, late at night, it's one thing to try and resist the temptation. But by, say, 8 or 9 p.m., you're probably very, very low on willpower by that point. You've had a long day and you know you usually go for the easiest option. And so reaching for that potato chips becomes easy. But if they're not actually in your house, if you stopped buying them, then you're far less likely to get in the car, drive down to your local grocery store, pick up that chips. You'd probably think, hey, what am I doing? Why am I going out of my way for a bag of potato chips, which is clearly not a good idea at 9 p.m. in the evening. And you're more likely to go for the default option, which could be something healthy in your fridge instead. If you if you just want a, a late night snack, or in my case, just try not to eat and, and fast for about fourteen hours <laughs> um, overnight. But um, you know, just you know, people make culture change out to be some sort of you know s 
you know, dark art, but a lot of it is about changing the environment so that people's behaviors follow. Mm, yeah. Well, you talk a lot about self-limiting beliefs and behaviors picked up in the corporate world in the book and, and what you're just telling there. I mean, it reminds me of if you look at eating the potato chips at nine o'clock at night, say, so what if, I mean, for me, digging into what fundamental need is that meeting and, mm. and then looking at options as to how else can I meet that fundamental need because the fundamental need's not going to go away. Um, you might be able to get rid of the potato chips so that there's a bigger hurdle to then eat the potato chips at 9 o'clock at night, but the fundamental need is still there. So depending how big that hurdle is, you might actually go and get the chips from the store. Yeah, yeah. Well, the fundamental need could also be, I mean, on the surface level, you might say, well, I, I'm hungry, but mm -hmm. the fundamental need is probably something else like I'm bored That's or right. you know, maybe you've had a tough day so you're a little bit emotionally unstable. And so what we do in those cases is we tend to eat, um, but there's many other things you could do in that case as well, many other jobs. Jobs, uh, to, to, to use Clayton Christensen's analogy that you could hire in that case to get the job done. And it could be, hey, maybe I should just go for a walk. Maybe I should call a friend. Maybe I should read a book. These mm -hmm. are all things that can help cure that boredom and um, you know, get you back to some sort of emotionally balanced state. Um, rather than just going for the chips, which are probably just going to make you feel even worse once you're done uh, <laughs> devouring the whole pack. That's right. Because then you go on a guilt trip and I've just consumed all these empty calories. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing that occurred to me and, and it sort of came up with your surfing analogy and, and that's the idea of modeling. Now, you talk a little bit about it in the book, but I just wonder, you know, what's your view on looking at successful people that have what you want to have as an entrepreneur, modeling from them, doing what they do, but at the same time, in your way. So, mm. you know, so if you figure out their strategy, it's A, B, C, D, E, and then they get what you want. Um, so you do A, B, C, D, E, and then as you get what you want, you start to adapt that and mm -hmm. bring your own flavor onto it. Yeah, I think that's a good question. And, you know, a lot of people talk about models and I talk about uh, the Isaac Newton quote standing. If I've seen mm. further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants, right. which I'm a big believer in. And that's why I host a podcast, which is, you know, 300 episodes in now. And I've had the opportunity to speak to so many people across so many different fields. And I tend to ask them questions that I'm personally interested in. So, mm. um, but if there is something that I personally want to learn, um, such as say surfing, then I will speak to a few surfers and I'll say, Hey, what are the key key things I need to learn. I mean, because there are so many different components to it. There's the paddle out, there's the pop-up on the board, there's, you know, getting your balance right. But really focusing on things like, uh, you know, asking questions like, well, what are the most common mistakes um, that surfers make, that beginner surfers make? Because if I can get around that, that's going to save me a lot of pain. And then what are the, say, three to five things that can really help lift my game? And it could be that, um, there's you know, putting any putting pressure on certain parts of the board as you're about to to jump up makes a hell of a lot of difference so just by understanding what are you know the five things that i should avoid and the five things that i definitely should do that goes a long way but to take that further i mean it, I've just finished reading um, Stanley McChrystal's book, um, Leaders, in which he finds that you know good leadership works in context. It's contextual. So what, what worked for, say, Napoleon Bonaparte during the French Revolution or what worked for Alexander the Great you know, 2,300 years ago when he was invading Persia um, or what worked for Margaret Thatcher as a member of the Conservative Party in, in the UK 30 years ago may not have worked for the others because they mm. were all contextual. So, you know, in the case of, say, uh, Napoleon, it was because he had the whole French Revolution going on. And if it wasn't for the environment in which he found himself in, he pr probably would not have been able to muster the following that he did and his tactics may not have worked. So what I like to do is use models to try and get ahead, but then take those lessons and apply them to the unique circumstances in which I'm operating. Um, and, you know, that's something I definitely think is, is worth stressing because so many startup entrepreneurs I see uh, think that, well, there's this idea I came across in the United States. I'm going to bring it back to Australia because if I work there, it's definitely going to work here. Well, <laughs> not necessarily. I mean, America has, you know, 
what, 200, what, 300 million people. The cities are a lot closer together. There's different culture, different um, environmental conditions. Uh, whereas here, you know, we've really got like five big cities and they're all a good one hour flight between each other. And we've only got 23 million people. We've got a totally different, uh, you know, ecological realities and whatnot and, and different cultural values and everything else. So just because it works over there doesn't mean it's going to work here. I mean, there's regulation and things to consider. So take what works for other people, um, but adapt it for your own needs. And what I like to do is I actually like to speak to multiple people um, rather than just one person because mm. what works for... Um, <laughs> I think by, by speaking with multiple people and using multiple people as models, you tend to uh, say mesh, what's the word I'm looking for? Wash them against each other and identify the common patterns that apply across every single person's realities because they're probably the things that are most transferable, transferable rather across any context rather than just a certain thing that worked for them because, yeah. you know. Yeah, I like, a- like the idea of identifying the patterns and also because – you could take an idea that that works in the US. Let's say it's some product that people um, take out to clear the the road when it snows. Yeah, obviously that doesn't have a huge market in Australia. Uh, perhaps in up in the mountains, but there's not a lot of population up in the mountains. But if you mm. take the concept behind that and say, well, freeing up roads, that's a big issue here because the freeways are clogged up all the time. So, what's the concept behind? freeing up the road from snow that could be for perhaps transferred into mm. freeing up the road from traffic congestion and does that provide an opportunity so yeah so looking at it from a conceptual point of view i think was always good yeah definitely and i think that's um you know looking at things horizontally when it comes to identifying opportunities um for example in the case of uh ge what they found was yes um you know autonomous vehicles are becoming a thing, but hey, we don't sell autonomous vehicles. But if you take that technology that underpins autonomous vehicles and apply it to things like planes and trains, which GE does in fact manufacture, then what are the implications? Um, And you could take that even further and look at, well, what are the implications of, say, all of the cars on the roads suddenly becoming autonomous and people just not driving? Well, currently only about 10% of cars that are registered actually on our roads. Many of them are sitting in garages and whatnot. And so if you become autonomous, there'll be less need for cars and also less need for things like parking lots. So large commercial real estate companies who have all these 10 story parking lots will find themselves holding on to worthless assets. But mm. what can potentially come of those parking lots, or maybe you turn them into say urban farms or things of that persuasion that can help us uh, with, you know, uh, environmental support, but help us with agriculture and everything else. So, that you know thinking about the downstream effects and thinking about things horizontally around how might how might this technology apply to different products different industries and that just gets those uh you know cognitive juices firing and you start yeah, to yeah. identify a lot more opportunities that's um, right well, you, you've probably given us about half a dozen ideas there <laughs> in terms of new opportunities painting that picture so yeah now you mentioned uh the podcast earlier and i'd like to ask about that because you've got, I think the last I checked, you were at episode 322 published. Um, so how long ago did you start the podcast? Yeah, it would have been uh, February 2016, so just over three years. Okay. And what what's changed with the podcast in that time? So mm. I mean, initially, yeah. with podcasts that have been running so long because most podcasts, they kind of start out and they're gone by it's 10 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I've had a couple of those as well, um, but Future Squared has just, I don't know, stayed the course. And I, I think initially when we started out, it was very much um, a form of personal branding as well as marketing for Collective Campus. And the podcast was all about corporate innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, but I guess I, I won't say I got bored discussing just that, but I, the more I worked in this space, the more I realized that corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, it's not just about the the discipline and the theories behind say the lean startup and whatnot it is about psychology and cognitive biases it is about economics it's about all these different things that go into making decisions and so we've since evolved or the podcast has since evolved to rebrand itself from corporate innovation and entrepreneurship to helping you navigate a brave new world which is essentially what it does and and the, and the way we do that is by bringing together uh, thought leaders across a variety of fields um, that essentially helps people think 
um, in a multidisciplinary way. So, you know, I've had guys like Mick Wall on the show who was, you know, a four, four decade rock journalist who's worked with Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and started with nothing and made his way to the top of the field and um, now publishes numerous books on the topic, mm. right through to comedians like Arj Barker. And, you know, then I'll speak with Tyler Cowan, who is a world renowned economist, um, uh, through to Michael Shermer, who is, you know, a member of the intellectual dark web, as they say, and, and the founder of Skeptic Magazine. And so by speaking to so many different people, one thing I've found is that so-called experts in the same field will totally contradict each other which just brings me back to the whole strong opinions loosely held <laughs> philosophy because just because you read something in a book doesn't mean it's right just because you read it in a research paper and it's been peer reviewed doesn't mean it's right there's different ways you can look at data to confirm a pre-existing belief and peer reviewers only have so much time to look at things um but that whole even my thinking just by having all these conversations has changed significantly so i'm trying to bring that to my audience so that they can ultimately make better decisions um and just look for what is more true rather than what what they think is absolutely right because we have a tendency to think that just because it's in a research report it's true it's 100 percent right but the reality is it's probably more right and that is only based on the evidence that we have collected until now um, but if you present us with new evidence then we'll change our opinion similar to the whole black swan um, events you know for yeah. centuries we didn't think they existed and the whole term black swan was used to refer to something that's impossible until you know what a couple hundred years ago we found them off the coast of the west of australia and it's like oh actually they, they do exist. Yeah. So always, That's right. always and, be open to Black Swan events. And it's a little bit like you were talking about leadership before in context. It's, you know, this, something may be true in one context, but not in another context. And, mm -hmm. and also, you know, I've, I've been doing a lot of um, work on mindset and belief and, and the brain and understanding that a little bit more. And so, you know, part of that is well, we really only construct our own reality anyway. So... So if you yep. hold on really tightly to some belief or some opinion that uh, the question really is how well, how well is it serving you? And if it's not serving you well, well, the loosely held uh, philosophy could add a lot of value. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Um, and I, just on what you said there about our realities, and I had Jamie Wheel on my show a while ago, and um, he's from the Flow Genome Project, and he wrote the book uh, Stealing Fire with Stephen Kotler. And one thing he he put forward was the fact that in any given situation, we have uh, about fifty thousand bits of information in our immediate environment, mm. something like fifty thousand. But the human brain will only become conscious of about 700 bits of information. That's so right, yeah. yeah, if we're in the same room, we could be having a completely different experience of, of that room um, exactly, just based on yeah. what we choose to focus on. Yeah. And of course the human brain's amazing because it filters out all that information in order to be able to maintain sanity, basically to, to kind of actually take in some information that might be useful to you at that time. But as you say, the, you filter out so much that the experience that two people have of the same event could be entirely different. Mm -hmm. And and again, you know, you mentioned mindset. I think you can also become intentional about what you choose to actually focus on in any given situation too. And that doesn't necessarily need to be just your physical environment, but also um, your mental environment and, and which of the thoughts that are, you know, in your uh, consciousness right now are actually relevant which ones aren't and how should you choose to interpret those thoughts and that goes a long way to to hardening or to strengthening your self-belief and um, which then uh, dictates the kinds of behaviors you take and if those behaviors are more positive then over a period of time they will accumulate and you will get results um, rather than those beliefs uh, being self-limiting and you falling victim to them in the first place never taking the action and then a year down the track you're wondering why you still can't you know, get your, your life together or get the yeah. results you're looking for. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, I could keep going on these topics for ages, but I'm aware of the time. So I think it's time we moved on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions. Hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers that'll inspire people to go and do something awesome today. Let's do it. Yeah. So what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Uh, they need to develop a strong relationship or a healthy relationship with adversity. 
uh, without without doubt, because innovation doesn't matter how good your idea is, how technically gifted you are, how smart you are, how good your team is, how much money you have, it will be fraught with setbacks, uh, with hurdles, with rejection, because if you're doing anything that is shrouded in ambiguity, you're going to have to face the word no. So develop a healthy relationship with adversity um, that will keep you in the game a lot longer than other people who quit at the first sign of difficulty. Yeah, that's great advice. And you said something earlier about separate it from your ego. So if you get the no, it's not about you. It's it's feedback on the idea or the exactly. product. And if you, yeah, that's part of developing that relationship. And another thing, one of our, our guests said, um, uh, thinking back who that was, um, can't remember now, but uh, that a no is just for today. Mm-hmm. So, which I thought was an interesting reframe of that as well. Yeah, well, I, I like to say every no gets you closer to a yes. So <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. right. All right, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Uh, just do a hell of a lot of reading and listening to audiobooks and podcasts as widely as possible because – and the reason I stress as widely as possible, because creativity and innovation is about the intersection of diverse ideas. Um, so that, that, that for me is it. Um, it's, and that goes back to what I was saying about the podcast. You know, it's not enough to just read uh, down across one domain. So get a deep understanding across a very narrow domain, because that's not going to help me come up with ideas. Um, but if I can read, uh, horizontally, and then I can combine, say, some technology I've come across with some problem I found in a totally different field, um, and then tie that into some business model and then some marketing channel that I've come across somewhere else. Uh, that then starts to look like something that could potentially uh, be a game changer. But yeah, so w- read widely. Yeah. All right. That's great advice. And I, I love doing that as well. And there's, there's lots of ideas that can actually be transferred, particularly you look at what we were talking about earlier in terms of what's the strategy or what's the what's the system behind that taking away the context and and just understanding the system or structure behind that mhm what's one of the resources you use most often uh one of the resources i use most often i'm just like madly looking at my desktop here to, to <laughs> um, but we're talking about a, a like a tool or something to that effect yeah could be a tool. Well, yep. Some people said they they like to journal or. Yeah, I, I definitely journal, but I won't say that because you've just said that. But uh, <laughs> Bra- Brain FM would be one of them. Uh, Brain FM. It's basically a website um, whereby essentially you listen to binaural beats. So it's a form mm. of white noise, and I'm a big. Um, f- big believer in the concept of flow, uh, the psychology of flow, where you, you basically are. Uh, deeply immersed on one task and the rest of the world essentially seems to fade away. And I find in that space, I am at least three times more productive than I am um, when engaged on shallow level tasks. But to get into flow requires um, that you do away with interruptions, but tools like Brain FM uh, essentially help hack that flow state. So I find that after listening to binaural beats for five minutes to 10 minutes, um, I'm just totally into what I'm doing and I've forgotten about everything else. Um, and that's a great way to help me get into flow so that I am more productive throughout the day, particularly if I'm doing something creative like writing a blog post um, or something that just requires critical thinking. Mm-hmm. That's a really interesting one. I'm not sure if it's Brain FM, but I've had some of those running where I'll have um, – a little brook running in the background. So you just hear sort of a bit of rustling leaves and a yeah. bit of flowing water or, or it might be birds chirping. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that can work. Also, listening to the same song on repeat, um, that's something that uh, the founder of Automatic, uh, whose name escapes me right now, uh, oh, Matt, does. Matt, 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 Matt Mullenweg, that's yeah. it. Um, yeah, he, he does that because – you're not constantly le- listening to new songs. You're not singing along. It's the same song on repeat, and that can also help to to stimulate that flow state. Mm, that's an interesting one. All right. Uh, what's the best way to keep a project on track? <laughs> the best way to keep a project on track, I think, is one, just really prioritizing and focusing on what are the key tasks that matter. Um that for me is is gold because if you do that, you're more likely to start to see results. And if you see results, that motivates you to keep going. And so that energy management piece is is huge. Um, and tracking 
progress. So understanding or defining what are the key metrics that matter on this project. And if you're tracking that on, say, a weekly basis, you can then adapt to changing realities so you can keep that project on track rather than just deliver and then three months down the track, you check in and it's not quite where it needs to be. It's completely off track. That's not really going to work. Um, but it does come back to the underlying purpose of the project and aligning that purpose with the values of the people that are working on that project. Because if the, there is no alignment, uh, you're going to struggle to get people to really invest energy and time and enthusiasm into the project. And for me, that's the number one thing that makes projects go off track if people just don't really buy into it and don't really care. So aligning the values with the purpose of the project. Yeah, that's really great advice. And, you know, you touched on a lot of things there, but I think the aligning projects to the culture of the people and, and ultimately to the culture and values of the business is going to give you the maximum chance or opportunity for actually driving that forward. And then if you do the prioritization and focus and tracking things regularly to make sure they're on track or where you need to adapt and adapting quickly because you, I think you said results gives momentum and, and mm -hmm. builds that motivation. So yeah, some great it, stuff there. Yeah, definitely. It's kind of like um, you know, these digital transformation um, projects that large banks roll out and they last for five years. And <laughs> I've spoken to you know a lot of um, uh, employees at these companies who are halfway through these projects and their morale is absolutely yeah. like rock bottom because they're using some waterfall project approach. So you don't really get any benefits realization until the project is actually completed, you know, five years in. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that definitely isn't motivating. <laughs> yeah, no, so quite the opposite. All right, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Um, really just being very conscious of your strengths um, and doubling down on that. Um, I think so many people go through life living a false purpose based on what society expects of them, based on what their parents may have expected of them growing up. And what happens is you do something that may be looked upon by society as a reputable profession, but it doesn't align with your natural inclinations, your strengths, and something you really care about, which ties into what we just discussed. Because if it really ties into not just what you value, but also your natural strengths, then you're going to perform a hell of a lot better at it. Those results are going to reflect that. And you're going to, as a byproduct of that, just do what most other people won't do and therefore you different, differentiate yourself by way of your energy for what you're doing and the results that you're getting because it doesn't align with, align with your strengths. So it, you can try and you know um, hack things and use tools and techniques, but unless you're really doing something that you believe in that aligns with your natural strengths and inclinations, then you're not going to be the best in the world at it. At least I don't think. It's going to be very hard to be. Yeah, that's that's really wonderful advice. I mean, there's a lot... Lot you said there that could be unpacked, <laughs> and um, <laughs> as I said, I could keep talking for ages on this. But there's um, it's it's quite. I mean, I fall into the trap every now and then of doing something, and and I'm either uncomfortable or I lack some motivation or drive to do it. And if I take time to think about it and kind of really reflect internally, what's going on? it comes back to that, that something is not in alignment there. Either it's not something that's my strength or I'm not passionate enough about doing what it is um, or it's it's a project that doesn't align with our values. So Definitely. I mean, if I look at my first uh, entrepreneurial venture with Hotdesk, um, you know, a couple of years into that, I basically came to the realization that I didn't really want to be a glorified real estate agent, which <laughs> <laughs> didn't really get me out of bed with a spring in my step every morning. Whereas now with Collective Campus, it's about working with people, whether they're startup entrepreneurs or whether they're innovation teams in larger organizations to unlock their ability so that they can then put their resources to use, create some value adding products for the world and ultimately lead more fulfilling lives where they walk away from the office each day feeling like, you know, they actually contributed something and they're happy and they can go on and enjoy their, their weekends and, and evenings and whatnot. Um, that for me is a lot more motivating than just putting bums on seats in an empty office space somewhere. Hmm. 
All right. Well, thanks very much, Steve. This has been really great. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Where can people reach out and uh, find out more about you, find out more about the book Employee to Entrepreneur, and also maybe get in touch if they choose to do so? Sure. Uh, thanks, Jürgen. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, people can find me at steveglaveski.com. That's G-L-A-V-E-S-K-I. Um, on that website, they'll find links to my blogs, uh, the Future Squared podcast, um, my Twitter profile, which is Steve Glaveski. And if they're interested in finding out more about the book, they can head over to employee2entrepreneur.io and there they can download a free bonus bundle, which has a lot of tools and tips on things like uh, mindset, uh, productivity, sales, marketing, and growth hacking as well, which um, would be quite beneficial for anybody uh, working on ideas, whether they're entrepreneurs or corporate innovators. So check that out, employee2entrepreneur.io. Yeah, and we'll post links to all of that in the show notes and certainly the bonus bundle at employee2entrepreneur.io really is very good. I've downloaded that and looked through some of the information there. So I highly recommend that. All right. um, So what's the number one piece of advice you'd give to any business owner who wants to be a leader in innovation and in their field? (laughs) The number one piece of advice... If you were to ask me this question tomorrow, I'd probably give you a totally different answer, Jürgen. But uh, I'd say it really is about prioritizing, outsourcing, and automating. Um, Those three things together will help you focus on where you can add the most value rather than just wasting your time on things that make you feel like you're busy, but come the end of the day, haven't really moved the needle forward. Um, The reason why I've been able to write three books in the last three years, publish 300 podcast episodes, um, build the business up to a seven-figure value is because I don't do a lot of that stuff that so many entrepreneurs out there will waste their time on. Um, You've got to focus on your natural inclinations, your strengths, and what you can be the best in the world at. You need to focus on Developing relationships with clients, um, you know, focusing on the strategic side of the product development, and by spending more time on that, you're more likely to get to success. So, prioritize, cut, outsource. That's going to bring down your feedback loop, um, tying in all the things we've talked about on this show. Mm. Um, and by doing that, I think you will have a massive advantage over so many other entrepreneurs and innovators who just aren't doing that. And I've seen this firsthand. I'd say, ten percent of people I come across. Uh, really, really deliberate about their productivity and effectiveness and how they manage their attention on a day-to-day basis. So if you can do that, you give yourself a massive leg up over the competition. Mm, yeah, that's great advice. And and you do talk a lot in the book about productivity and outsourcing and, and in the context of growing a business. So there's a lot there in terms of making sure that you're focusing your energies on the things that do move the needle forward for the business. 100%. Yeah. So finally then, who would you like me to interview on a future Nova Buzz podcast and why? Huh. Uh, who would I like you to interview? Um, I would suggest you interview the, the, the hosts of the What You Will Learn podcast, um, Adam Ashton and Adam Jones. Um, they've interviewed a stellar um, lineup of podcasters, oh, sorry, of uh, innovators um, and authors, and they're just really good value. I mean, I think you'd really enjoy chatting with them about all manner of things. Um, they can definitely, they definitely uh, subscribe to my uh, philosophy of reading very, very widely, um, and I think they read a book a week, so you, you guys would have an awesome conversation. Okay, that sounds fascinating. All right, well, we might get an introduction to the two Adams from you and we'll Happy get to them do on that. the podcast in, in a future episode. All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us today on the Innova Buzz podcast. It, it was really generous of you. I've really enjoyed this immensely. I've learned a lot. And of course, the book is great value. So thanks for you know, putting those ideas out there in a way that is so accessible for people. All the best for the future and let's keep in touch. No worries. Thanks, Jürgen. It's been a pleasure, like I said, and, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak with the, uh, the listeners of the Innova Buzz podcast. Thanks. I do hope you enjoyed that insightful and engaging conversation with Steve and, like me, learned from what he shared. Some things that I took away from this interview are the similarity in the structure of the Lean Product 
development methodology and performance appraisal. That's something I wasn't aware of before. Also, the idea of testing assumptions as quickly as you can and the importance of culture and culture match in keeping projects on track and moving. I'd love to know what you took away from Steve's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which can be found at innovabiz.co forward slash Steve Glaveski. That is S-T-E-V-E. G-L-A-V-E-S-K-I All lowercase, all one word, in overbiz.co forward slash Steve Glaveski. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Steve there, as well as links to his website, to the Future Squared podcast, and to his employee to entrepreneur book as well as all the other resources that we spoke about in the conversation. Steve suggested we interview Adam Ashton and Adam Jones from the What You Will Learn podcast on a future InnovaBuzz podcast. So Adam and Adam, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the InnovaBuzz podcast courtesy of Steve Glaveski. Remember to visit innovabiz.co forward slash VIP to access the Transformational Marketing Hub and all its free and exceptionally useful information to help transform your marketing. Also, check out the Tales of Marketing Transformation show at talesofmarketingtransformation.com where each episode will provide one valuable message to guide you on your journey of marketing transformation. Tune in again next week to the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got more fantastic guests lined up, including Tom Vergese, the founder of Cultural Synergies, and Jackie Lappin of Speakertunity. Stay connected. Subscribe to the Innova Buzz podcast so you'll make sure you'll never miss another episode. Head on over to innovabiz.co forward slash subscribe. We'd also love you to leave us a review because what you think matters to us. Take some of the ideas you've heard today and apply them in your business. Any thoughts, ideas, suggestions or questions, then share them in the comments below the blog post. And remember, if you want to get better marketing results than you ever have, join our fantastic Facebook community at the Tales of Marketing Transformation Facebook group. All you have to do is go to innovabiz.co forward slash TMA. It's free to join. I hope to see you there soon. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember to be awesome and keep innovating.